Unto thee, O oh God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near thy wondrous works declared. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Salah. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly, and to the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. And I've read to you from the 75th division of Psalm, verses 1 through 7, and may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this word. Most Holy Father, we come to you this morning with bowed down head. We want to thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And thank you, Father, for being the Father that you are to us. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your love, your comfort. We just thank you because you're the one that said you'd never leave us, nor forsake us, and you would be with us until the end of the ages. Father, we thank you. We want to ask you to bless us today. Bless those that are here and those that are on their way and those that are lost, Father. Touch them too. Let them know that without you they can do nothing. And Father, as we go through your word today, we ask that you open up hearts and minds and let us know that it is to our benefit that we should always be practicing godly virtues. And through you, Father, we can accomplish that. In your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our lesson today is entitled, Practicing Godly Virtues. And we're in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. So we'll go around the room quickly. There's a lot of scriptures here. And I'll get through, and I don't want anybody to get anxious about the words and the scripture. We're all here together, and we'll help you through. So we'll start, <coughs> bless you, thank you, my Lord. We'll start out with, um, let's start with Sister Winston, if you'll take the first verse, which is verse 5. And Sister Christina can follow with the six. By mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, even constituents, and covenant, which is about you. While you're there, read verses 7 and 8. And the which ye also walked some time when ye lived with them. But now ye also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blessing, filthy communication out of your mouth. Think in which way? Yes. Verse 9. Nine. Eight and nine. 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 Lie not one to another, seeing that you that ye have put off the old man for his deeds. Amen. And Sister Katie, would you read verse ten? There's no I in there. And have 
I put on the new man, which is the one and knowledge after the amazing the image. That the image of this him that created him. Amen. And we can press with you read verses 11 and 12. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythians, 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 on nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bound for mercy, kindness, humbleness, and mind, meekness, long suffering. Amen. And uh, Sister Carter, verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also would you be. And Sister Dorothy, verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity. Charity is, is the crown of perfect. 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 Yes. Yes. And uh, Deacon Mike, if you will read 15 and 16, and he may sure you finish up to 17. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another <clears throat> excuse me, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Amen. We were instructed to read in our study Ephesians chapter 4 through 25. No, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 25, through chapter 5, verse 2. And then also coming back to Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. So, for those of you that study, and I would like to think that we all do, then we don't have to go through all of these things. See, because that when you're home during the week, you're supposed to be studying. And so you got your guideline right in your Sunday school book to tell you. But uh, when we look briefly at Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting at 25, what basically is being talked about is putting off your old self and then putting on the new self. You know, the old man, the new man. When you become a child of God and you're saved, then people should see something different. We all started out in the world. There was sin that came down to us from Adam. And we didn't have a thing to do with it. But when we were in the world, we act just like the world. But once you become saved, and then you, you put on Christ, you put on him, somebody should see something different about us. So that's what that's talking about in there. Putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Telling us to don't be angry and don't sin. You know, a, a lot of the same things that's covered in our lesson. Never give place to the devil. And we've heard, <laughs> don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you have an offer with somebody, please try to reconcile. Don't go to bed with that. 
Because if you do, you're going to wake up in the morning with that same evil spirit. And we have to learn to go to people and apologize and ask for forgiveness. Sometimes it's hard, but God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit that's within us to help us if we want to be helped. So that that's basically what that says is, is giving instructions to the believers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. All of the same things pretty much that's in our lesson today. So I'm not going to go through it because, like I said, we had instructions to study that part. So, but I'm just bringing that up to bring me into this lesson. And so here in our lesson, it starts out with Paul actually giving instructions to the Colossians. And we know that Paul did go out and set up a lot of the churches, but this was one that he did. But he was concerned. Paul was in jail during the time that he sent these instructions out to them. And they, would, they went out by uh, a person by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras. Epaphras something. I read it, but I just want to make sure that I try to get this right. But when in my study it said Epaphras was in jail with Paul. And he was, Epaphras was actually from Colossae. Colossae is the city, and the Colossians is just like we live in the city of Buffalo, so we're both Buffalonians. You see what I mean? So that's why they were called Colossians, because they were in the city of Colossae. And Epaphras was also, he was from there. He met Paul, uh, was in jail at the same time Paul was. Okay? And so he was the one that went back and took the instructions to the Colossians in Africa, because Paul was in jail. All right? So here in the fifth verse, it says, Mortify therefore members which are upon the earth. Our first outline, in our outline, the first part is rescued from the old life. When you say mortify, that means to put to death. Kill it. Just like when we become saved and you'll hear people say, oh, that old man almost came out. He's still in there. Yeah. But we need to be working daily to renew our minds and to put it to death. <laughs> put it to death in the name of Jesus. Mortify, therefore, your members which are on the earth. And you say, what members are they talking about? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul looked at covetous, covetousness as if it was idolatry. So when I looked at that, and I'm telling you, I got a whole lot of markings in my expository because they go through all of the meanings of these words. And I hope that um, you had a chance to look them over. But you know, when we think about a fornication, sometimes we think about it in one way, uh, having sex out of marriage. But in our studies here, it says that the word for fornication originally referred to prostitution. Okay? And, but it says by the New Testament times, it was applied to any kind of sexual immorality. Any sexual activity outside of the marriage of one man to one woman is sinful. Then it also mentions uncleanness. And uncleanness can refer to different kinds of impurity. But actually, in Colossians, it says it refers to immorality immorality, moral defilement, inordinate affection can be translated passion or either a desire, whether it's a good desire or a bad desire. 
and bad desires, you know, they bring on negative consequences. Evil concupiscence, bad desires, lust is equivalent to adultery. You know, we hear all the time it says you can you can lust but don't sin. But it's so close to sin. And if you're constantly involved and in looking at people with a lustful eye, eventually you will act on it. We see it in the news and on on the news a lot, where we see men being arrested and put in jail for what? Child pornography. Well that started somewhere. You know, it started with the eyes, the senses, the looking, looking on little children. Those are inordinate affections, you know. And then after a while, you start sending for tapes. You got tapes, and you sit back looking at all that. And then, if it don't stop there, the next thing, you'll lure a little kid into the house. This, this, this is immoral activity. Bad desires, evil, concupiscence, uh, covetousness, a desire to have more. You know, sometimes we look at other things and things that other people have, and we want it. And, 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 but it can also mean a desire to have more. A business person or, or somebody that's involved in, in a lot of gambling and stuff, and, and nothing is never enough. You win. You can't be satisfied with your winnings. So what do you do? You, 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 you waste all of that. You go back and you keep on. You know, a good example of that is in the casino. A lot of people are barred out of the casino because they got a wife and a family at home. And they don't know how to stop. Every time they get paid, they run to the casino. If they, even if they hit the $1,200, that don't satisfy them. Because they'll sit back there at the machine and lose it all back. And finally the wife says, no, if my husband comes to the casino, don't let him in. Dick, some of them are fired out. A lot of people, they say, no, we don't want that in our neighborhood. Because it changes the neighborhood. People don't know when to stop. If you hit, you want to hit again. You want more and more. And that's greed. It's covetousness. A constant quest for more and more material things reveals that those things have become our gods. See, and that's why God frowns on it. We don't look at it that way. But that's God's word. That's the way he looks at it. Because he said, I will supply all of your needs. So what are we trying to get? If he say he's going to supply our needs, why do we have a need to just go on and on? Because we're not satisfied. And maybe we're not trusting in what the Lord says. But these are the very things that bring about the wrath of God. It will, of course, culminate in his future climactic visitation on evil. I looked that word up, culminate. It means bring to a head. You know, it's just like you get a little boil on it, and you put some of that salt pork or something on it. Eventually, it will culminate. It will come to a head. And that's what they're talking about with God. It will come to a head, and he will bring his wrath on evil. Uh, here in our lesson it says for which things sake the wrath of God coming on the children of disobedience and his wrath is coming sometimes we feel like we're getting away but we can't get away he may not come when we think or maybe like the pastor says mama let a long time pass by he thought he had got away <laughs> but she never forgot and when she got him, she got him good. And that's the way God is. Sometimes he's slow coming. And we think he done forgot all about it. But no, he hasn't. In the which he also walked sometime 
when you lived in them. And see, that's talking about us. We as Christians have done all of these things. We've gone to the casinos. We've gambled. We played numbers. We do all of this stuff. That's but that's worldly. Don't don't get it twisted. That's the world. And so when we find ourselves involved, we have to learn to say, Lord, help me with this. Because I can't help myself. <laughs> you know, I see it's a big jackpot coming and it's thirty million dollars. I'm tempted to go play me another. <laughs> that's the flesh. But and God know it. He already know we're going to do this stuff. But if we really want to stop, we can ask the Lord to help us. And he will. Because even if we hit that great big jackpot, I look at it and I say, we would not have any peace at all. No satisfaction. Your family ain't going to leave you alone. You can't hide from them. Folks going to come to you that, that you ain't never heard of trying to act like they related. We think if we hit big, we'll be happy. I really don't think so. In the which ye, ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Put off anger. When you get mad with somebody, don't stay mad. Try to come to a resolution. Wrath, which wrath says is a different type of anger. It comes on hot and fierce. That's like the wrath of God, y'all. He come on like that too. Malice, when we can be so malicious and do things to people, we in our mind we already thinking about the evil we're gonna bring on them. Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Uh, when we talk about filthy communication, and you know, yeah, a lot of us, we learn how to curse from people around us, from our parents, from our friends, and, and a lot of us still engage in it, you know, and because we hear it everywhere, and it becomes commonplace, but we need to know that it's not right. You know, everything you look at, I'm surprised and I don't know why, but even now when I look at TV, it's nothing for them but a B word to be used. And don't nobody bat an eye. On TV, all kind of profanity. And we accept that our young folks, that's a lot of that's views out of their mouth. And you know what? They're even parents that give their children permission to use profanity. Talking about at a certain age. Not in my house. All of my children I can swell from. But they respect me enough that they do not talk to me in that language. And if they should ever, I would check them and put them in check. I'm not your friend. And no, we're not going to have a two-way conversation and you looking at me cursing and going on like it's all right. I have too much respect for my children, for my friends, for other family members. And if you start talking to me in that language, I feel disrespect. But it's commonplace. A lot of parents don't bat an eye. They'll sit up and have a conversation with their kids. And that's all coming out of each of their mouths. We as Christians, we need to know that that's wrong. And that's what Paul is telling them. This church here, the Corinthian church, was a church that had received God. And they were doing well. But Paul knew that they come from a pagan background. And they were getting some wrong information, even though they knew about God and the Word of God. And when you get wrong information coming in and out, you get confused. And, and some, if you listen to it, sometimes you get caught up in it. And so Paul here sent them a word to tell them how to live in Christ. 
how to live in Christ. And here he says in the ninth verse, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Stop lying. Tell the truth. Every time you turn around, it's a shame. And in here, in our uh, teaching, it talked about promotions. You know, when people try to sell you stuff, and they'll come to you and tell you how it's the best product in the world. It can do this. It can do Just to get you to spend your money. I think about the man I see on the commercial about the mattresses, extreme mattresses. <laughs> and he gets on there and put everybody else down that sells mattresses but himself, because he got the best, and he wanted you not to let nobody else deceive you. Well, why should I trust him? See, but that's their pitch, and, and we have to be aware of that. When people look at you and say, oh, you can trust me, can you? Trust God. That's who you trust. Pray and ask him which way to go and what decisions to make. And verse 10, and have put on the new man. We have put on the new man. We have put off the old man with the old man's deeds. It used the same analogy as when you put on new clothes. When you put on new clothes, but you throw them old ones aside. In the same way when you put on your new man through Christ and in him, that old man has to go away. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's something we have to work at constantly. And when we slip back, pray, and say, Lord, I need you, so I can get right back on the right track again. It's a growing process. You know, you hear people say, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. But that's growing. And so, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Renewed in knowledge after the image of Christ. And God, God created us. We have the knowledge of him. We have the knowledge of his word. We should be able to not just know, but we need to be able to do also. It's one thing to know his word. But to do it is altogether different. And so that's what Paul's call to them and us today is to do the word. Don't just know it. You're sending two signals if you know it and you don't do it. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And we know that he's no respect of person. There should be no division in God's people. We are all as one. He made it so. He died on the cross. Not just for a select few, but for the whole world. Even those that hated him. The ones that spit on him and pierced him in the side. So, there's no separation. We know that the Jews wanted to be with the Jews. They looked down on the Gentiles. Christ did. And we should meet. That's verse 11. Rescue from the old life. Christ can rescue us from the old life. And Paul was just letting the Colossians know that I got a good report about you, but I know what's lurking around you, and it's easy to get involved. This is what you need to be trying to do in the spirit, because you got help. Questions, comments, that first part, rescue from the old life. Deacon Mike, I heard you had a rough time, <laughs> but you know, God, That's what I was laughing about. <laughs> yeah, God is able, you know, and so you just got to be steadfast and you got to be constantly praying, yeah. you know, because that's nothing but the devil. Yeah. And he's lurking all about That's I haven't heard that so much since yesterday. He's always lurking about it. 
you know, ready to get in there and steal your joy. But through the help of the Lord, you can say, Satan, you're a liar. And the true thing, then you get thee behind me in the name of Jesus. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. Sister Winston. <laughs> uh, when I saw this lesson, it said, the practice of God can't practice without the Holy Spirit. <coughs> That's you gotta have a relationship. And the thing, first thing came to our mind was that He's showing us how to handle things, but if we don't study, we, we won't know how to handle it. And I know this right away is that mortify. You can't put something to death unless you have to attempt to take care of it. That's right. So you first you got to acknowledge that it's there. And then I, I like how it says, you know, uh, when we read this, is that it's not just to be reading, but also for us to do it. For us to and do. I see that where people, uh, uh, when they read, and it says that, you know, they say this sin is little, and this is, sin is sin, and it all got to be dealt with. So then, when you see what is what it's telling us, it's not talking to the world. It's talking to the believer. All these lessons coming from believing. You can't go out there and give this to unbeliever and expect them to do mm -hmm. it. And you got to start with you. That's it. It ain't telling you to mortify somebody else's. Mortify, mortify your own. own. What is happening with you. So when it said that, I said, you know what? And if you don't do it, see, you might not wake up in the morning. That's right. That's why I said, don't lay down. On your right. As soon as, and he said, I'm not expect you to do this on your own. But he said, soon, and I know you don't know it all, but as soon as you know it, walk there in. Walk there in. You know, God chose us. You read and you see uh, where it talks about the elect of God. The elect are the chosen. We didn't choose ourselves. He chose us when we were yet in our mother's womb. Way back before, and when he started this creation, he knew all about mm -hmm. us. And so I looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Because here it says that believers are like living stones. Right. And verse 4 and 5, 1 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And that's the way God looks at us through Jesus. We were chosen. And we do things for his name's sake. You know, just like when your mother brought you up. And she said, child, don't go out there and make me shame. It's not about us. It's about him. We do for his name's sake. You know, something else I noticed in this lesson, and they didn't break it down, but when they talk about that, even constituents, people don't talk to them, but that's, that's where our day coming out. Is oh, yeah. You got, uh, it says, Every sin is brought about with a thought. And so uh, it's, you start thinking this, and he was saying, right in there, I don't know what the other going to be seeing, but the Spirit showed me this is where he's talking against men loving men. That's right. Men loving men. And you need to be brought out because a lot of young people, and uh, Lord help us with this. But, Nobody's telling them. They say, oh, well, they'll find out. But a lot of them that's working now with me is they like the girls. I can be with that man, because I don't need the man to be Exactly. And uh, this is this talk is going on. We got to let them know that's not of God. That's not of God. When we talk about inordinate affections, okay, well, and we yeah. had that in a previous lesson, mm -hmm. you know, men looking at men and women looking at women. I'm telling you, some of these women out here, and that sometimes you have to give them a double look because they look just like boys. And a lot of it is what they did to themselves. They cut all their hair off, you know, and they really look manly. They wear 
man's clothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but no, it's not right. Uh, as parents, and what I hear, a lot of them say, oh, no, don't say nothing against my child. But it's not against your child. It's what the Lord has. But see, they, as you say, they don't know him. They, they don't know him. And, and uh, when we see things like that, we have to pray. Because, see, God can touch anything. He can touch it. But don't sit back and just accept it like it's normal. Because it's not. Uh, and I, uh, going back to this elect of God, in verse 5 it says, You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. We should be built up a spiritual house. And holy priesthood. And when you're a holy priesthood, the word holy means set apart. But if you ain't doing what you're supposed to do, you can't tell nobody else nothing. And see, that's what we have to realize. When we get involved in wrongdoing, we, what can we tell somebody else? Because they'll be quick to tell you. You trying to tell me? I saw you doing this, that, and the other. I heard you saying this, that, and the other. We have to be a living stone. We, we have to be able to set an example for somebody else to look at before we would dare to try to tell them they're going the wrong way. Because they'll look at you. And, to, and just because they out there in the world, don't think they don't know when you backslide. Because they'll be the first one to tell you. I thought you were saved. Well, if you say, why are you doing this, that, and the other? They'll question you on it. And that's the world. See, they know right from wrong. They might not be doing it, but they know it. And the minute you profess Christ, then their eyes are on you. That's about the light that's supposed to be shining. Yeah. What did you hear the pastor say? Somebody heard him cuss. And they say, you're cussing. I thought you said, he said, I am saved. But I'm still cussing. I'm working on it. You know, God is working on me. You know, and, and if he's working on you, that's fine. But if he ain't working on you, you are one of the disobedient that they talk about in this lesson. You know, you can sit around a room full of people that's using the B word and all other kind of profanity, and it don't bother you. If you in somebody else's house, you can't stop them from doing what their customers are doing. But you can get up and leave. Amen. You don't have to be a part of that. If you're not doing what they're doing, then it should be easy for you to leave. Right. Remove yourself. Because, see, the whole purpose is to get you drawn in. And once they draw you in, then they say, I know you didn't have nothing. We got to learn a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You offer up a sacrifice, any old sacrifice to God, then you're going to bring damnation on yourself because that's what happened with Cain, the two children of Adam and Eve. You ain't going to just give him any old thing. So, that's our first part there. The second part is called to the new life. If you don't mortify, there's consequences. For sure. That's what we don't want to ever forget. You don't do what God is calling you to do, there's consequences. That's right. You might think you ain't got away, but you have to. It's coming. Because he, he's not going to let you get away. He is the guy that's going to check you. Because if he don't check you, if you, don't, you, won't have, you won't have any way of trying to get it right. Uh, in verse 12, called to the new life, 12 through 17, it says, put on therefore as the elect of God. We talked about the elect, the chosen of God. He's telling you what to put on. Put 
on holy, the elect of God, holy and beloved. You're set apart. You're beloved by God. He loves us. So what are we going to put on? The vows of mercy. We're going to put on kindness. We're going to put on humbleness of mind. We're going to put on meekness. We're going to put on long-suffering. All the examples that Christ already set forth for us, he, we have them here. When we talk about, and I looked up that, uh, the vows of mercy. And here, when we talk about the vows of mercy, we say compassion. Be compassionate right. toward others. It says, like the Good Samaritan, we must show mercy to all. And I tell you, sometimes that's so hard. You can try and try and try. It's hard. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because he, he knew we couldn't do it by ourselves. He knew it. But we need to learn to be more compassionate. You know, some people we have to work extra hard with. We have to be extra diligent with them. You know, you saying no, go right, and they tugging and saying, no, nah, we need to go left. We need to go left. I know. I know. But you're going the wrong way all the time. But you I know. know. <laughs> you can't tell me. And that's when you have to just show mercy. And sometimes you have to back up and back off. You know, it, it, it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, when we talk about long-suffering, and that's a word we use often, because that's Christ. You know, God will wait on us. He'll give us chance after chance to get it right. And we have to be the same way. We have to give people a chance. But you still have an obligation when you see somebody going the wrong way. And that's for all of us, because we all go the wrong way sometimes. Nobody is perfect. Try to have them on the show and say, sister, you're going the wrong way. And they might say, I know. Back off. Start praying. And start praying. Because some of us have to go the wrong way. That's right. You know, I've started saying it more and more. Some people you can't help. And we try. But some people you just cannot help. And that's when you truly put them in the hands of the Lord. <coughs> and leave it there. And that comes to our children. Some of our relatives. Some of our friends. And some of us. Can't help them. We can tell them what's right. And hope and pray they listen. But we need to be long-suffering. Uh, it says that long-suffering is that quality of self-restraint in the face of provocation, which does not hastily retaliate or promptly punish. And that's God. See, he's not in a hurry to punish us. He wants to give us a chance to do the right thing, to repent. But if you stay out there, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, forbearing one another, putting up with one another. That's another one. We have to put up with one another. I have to put up with some of you, and you have to put up with me. But we all family. And if we do it in the Lord, we can stay family. Because we're all different. You know, we all learn different. We all on different levels. You know, some of us moving fast to get to the Lord, and some of us just drag. We just drag and slow. Some ain't moved. And some of them ain't moved. When I was in school, we had one student, and you know, we used to, our, our nutritionist was on the bottom floor of the school. And we had a class that had to go down there. And it was Frankie, her name was. Frankie was always late for class. It was in the basement. But you got out of the other class in plenty of time to get down there. Frankie would always be the last one. And Mrs. Silbox, she was our nutritionist. She looked at that girl one day. She said, you know what? You don't have but one pace. 
<laughs> and that's slow. You know, <laughs> and, and we just laugh. Did she change? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but she was still slow all the time. But Miss Silvac had just got so frustrated because everybody was there and we waiting on her before we could start the class. And here she's taking her time, dragging in. And some of us the same way with Christ. We just take our time, dragging it in. But we need to be a little bit more in a hurry to get to him. Because he has so much for us. And we don't want to miss out. And sometimes we can't wait for you. You know, if you drag. When you get there, half of everything is over. And you don't miss it. So we need to be, you know, on our feet and, and in a hurry. Just like we be in a hurry for a lot of other stuff that we trying to get to. We don't drag to everything. Uh -huh. Not what you love. That's right. It's what you love. And that's what God is displeased with. Because he said, and those are the gods that we end up having, whether we want to admit it or not. And he said, you ain't going to put no other God before me. Because I'm not going to do it to you. He's going to give us everything he promised us if we just believe it and lean on him and trust. So uh, the perfect model for forgiveness is the Lord Jesus. Because when he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was the perfect model. And he set that model for us so that we can learn to forgive. You know, sometimes we get mistreated. Sometimes we mistreat other people. And so we need to learn how to go and ask people for their, to forgive us. And if they don't, it, it, it's not on you anymore. You did what the Lord told you to do. You know, but he set the example. And, and don't be holding grudges and mad with folks because he also said vengeance is his. He will repay. Right. So let it go. Let it go. Uh, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye forgive others. And above all these things, put on charity. Charity. Charity is love. That's it. And, and God was the perfect example of that, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. And we need to be thankful people. You know, we need to be constantly thanking God because we have lived to be whatever age we are, and we've seen a whole lot of people go before us. He spared us this long for something. And it wasn't for the world, believe that. He didn't spare us for the world. A lot of times you hear people say, he left me here because he's still giving, he giving me ready. Because he's the only one that can. Yes. We can't get ourselves ready. But he can. Be thankful, people. You know, I started putting that little thankful note in our bulletin. And if any of you see anything around here that we need to be thanking somebody for anything, feel free to tell me before I do the bulletin. And I'll put it in. I don't have to be the only one thanking people. But we need to learn to be thankful and let people know that we're thankful for the little things that they do. You know, and I don't... I'm not particularly picking out any one other person, but if somebody do something, I'm grateful. And I want you to know I'm grateful. You know. <laughs> and that's why that's why the Lord laid it on my heart to, to put that thankful thing in the bullet. We need to be thankful people. Um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And you know what? When we do that, we're giving praise to the Lord 
in song, in hymns, mm -hmm. in, in all these different things, you know, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. That's why we study our Bible, you know. So if we got a word in us, and it's to dwell in us, but it's for us to be able to act it out, you know. We, we don't do all this to just hire it in and put it under a bush, you know. We got to put it out there, you know. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of who? That's right. Do it in the name of Jesus. Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We have so much to be thankful for. You know, when he wakes us in, up in the morning, oh, yes. you know, when we can get out of the bed and still be in our right mind. Mm -hmm. You know, when we can make it to the house of the Lord, to, to just praise him, to bless the Lord. You know, we have so much to be thankful for. Question, called to the new life. He is the one that calls us out of the old and brings us into the new. We don't call ourselves. He calls us because he got, he got work for us to do. And he ain't going to have you out here making him ashamed. No. Come on, T. I was thinking about call to the new life. The entire section is basically um, uh, a roadmap, if you ask me. It's a roadmap on what to do. I mean, 16 and 17 says the, well, actually the entire section, mm -hmm. but to me, uh, um, once you get saved, once you get saved, you sit there and think of saying, now, uh, what do I do next? But 16 and 17, especially 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in yes. all wisdom. In all wisdom? Not some wisdom or most wisdom? All wisdom. So we know right then and there, you have to go get his word mm -hmm. to get the wisdom. That's right. And teaching and admonishing one another. Mm -hmm. So that means... Helping one another. Helping one another. Just like in this setting right here, the Sunday school. Yes. Helping one another. Discussing the word and what, what's the what's the other one? Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. Someone brings something out, we, we, we talk about it, and, and hopefully it'll be helpful for everyone. But the 16 and 17 is so it's just so rich in instruction on what we need to do. Um, and uh, 17 for me. Personally, that's uh, something I need to do. That's I need to right. Keep my, I need to keep, my focus, keep my focus that, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm not doing this for this organization or that organization. I'm doing it because I'm supposed to do it, and I'm going to do it to the glory of God and get Him glory. And that's that. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard for me to remember that. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember that. You probably heard about it. Yeah, I did. But but you know, also, when I looked at that last section called to the new life, it takes us back to the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. And so we can find that in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Unless we go also, well, I don't know, I might just look at 22 through 26 and just read all five of those scriptures. Mm -hmm. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. We have to learn to be gentle with one another. You know, meekness, temperance, against us there is no law. And they that are Christ, in other words, those that belong to him, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. All that's been crucified. Hang it on the cross and leave it there. If we live in the spirit, let us also 
walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, why not walk in the Spirit? Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Empty things. Desiring. Never can get enough of nothing. I want more money. I want more of this. I want more of that. You can't be satisfied. That's vain glory. And the word says, let us not desire those things. Provoking one another. Envying one another. Looks like they're talking about a little covetousness there, right? Mm -hmm. That's when you envy other people. You look at them, you're jealous of what somebody else got. You want what they have. You can't be satisfied with what the Lord done blessed you with. But here, we got instructions. Don't be like that. Because God going to give us everything we need. Amen. So we need to learn to be thankful people, be satisfied, get somewhere and sit down and enjoy the goodness of God. Because all of this stuff here is supposed to bring us joy. When we get too involved in what's going on in the world, then we, we, don't, we don't have joy. Because that world will steal it from us. Take it clean from us. We be sitting up, I say, I say sitting around like your dog done die. You know how some of us get when we got a dog, I'm telling you, a dog is so close to us sometimes. Mm -hmm. That it, it, you know, it's family. Mm -hmm. And if that dog die, you be sitting there sick. You ever know saying sick as a dog? <laughs> you be sick as a dog. I lost two dogs that we had for many years. And I was sick. When the first one died, and I was double sick when Nina died. And so I'm saying that because we get tangled and tied up in the world. And when things don't go like we think they should, we'd be sitting around just like that. Like we sick as a dog. <laughs> Ain't got no joy. Because we looking for joy in something that's not God. When we get that godly joy and we can truly walk in his way, then we can be happy in him. We can have joy. We can have peace. And they say the kind of peace that he gives us is beyond our own understanding. That's right. <laughs> but that's what he gives to his children when they do his will. So I thank you all for participating in the lesson. Paul cried out for us to be practicing godly virtues. He was talking to the believers back there, and this word is for us today. Practice. Practice makes perfect. If you ain't practicing, you're going to miss your steps. But if you practice something long enough, you get good at it. And so that's what we need to start doing more of, practicing godly virtues. With that, I'm going to ask the friends to uh, dismiss us. This was the last lesson in this unit. I passed out Sunday school books to everybody. Thank That's the next you. week. And we're going to start all the way at the beginning of the Bible. Oh, in Genesis. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Julia.